Tech Revision with Mrs. Swanee Pooh. <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, this video is going to go through uh, an example of paper two, one that I've put together, trying my best to predict what potentially might come up um, in the A-level exam on Friday. So here we go. First thing I did was have a look at how the marks are spread out. So you can see from previous papers that there's kind of like a good mixture of lower mark questions up to about six marks. And then it's kind of a bit inconsistent, but usually there is at least one 12 mark uh, question. OK, so the maths in the question as well. Some of you will be happy to know that um, it's less maths, obviously, because it's a percentage of the overall marks. The amount of marks available for the entire paper is 80. Um, and of that, about 10 marks um, will be maths. So these are some of the topics that have uh, or kind of focuses that have come up in the past. Um, plotting a box plot, which kind of looks like a sort of like this kind of thing. Uh, ratios, mass, volume and density, graph equations, volume again, circumference, um, bit of trig again. Um, calculating like amounts to cover areas, like the amount of paint needed. So exciting. Uh, mass and graph plotting. So nothing too deadly, but again, it's about 10 marks. Um, so be wary of that as it may come up. So paper two is split into sort of two sections. Section A is all about product analysis. So you might be given a picture to look at. Um, and you might be asked to compare products. And section B is more general. Um, the questions that I had a look at didn't seem to fit particularly well uh, in either section, but I'll show you what you might encounter on the first section. So it's likely that you might come up across a, uh, or come across a question a little bit like this, where you're shown two different products, you're given some information about them, and you are asked to uh, compare them because this is product analysis so comparing the two products against each other um, and some of the things that you might be asked to compare are the ergonomics the materials that are used and maybe the function of the product so you can see on this drill one here it's ergonomics this one talks about safety here are two more so this one is showing you two different step ladders one made from um, probably like a hardwood like oak or maybe um, it could be like beach or something maybe as well. Uh, and this one is aluminium. And then again, you are asked to talk about safety and ergonomics here. D do remember that ergonomics is not just to do with like how well things are designed to fit the body. It's, it's also about things like weight and use of color, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and this last one here is comparing two camping lanterns. And this one is interesting because it asks you to compare the suitability of the materials, the manufacturing processes, and then the power sources, which is a bit weird, which I guess that's kind of like the function. Um, and these two here are almost like paper one topics. So talking about like why um, ABS might be suitable, why TPE might be suitable why low carbon steel sheet well it's malleable isn't it and easy to uh, deform can be press formed all sorts of things so expect a question like that in section a of the exam the next section is section b and this one is all to do with commercial manufacture <clears throat> i've picked these questions out so there's a couple here and a couple on the next slide because again it's giving you a picture of something to talk about so this one was another big 12 mark question and it shows you two products, one quite an old fashioned radio and the other one more of a, a modern sort of uh, digital radio. And this one is asking you to talk about developments in microelectrics and materials. So this one could really trip you up, especially if you're not happy talking about how transistors um, completely changed how electronics were designed and made in the 1940s, uh, about the importance of integrated circuits, about the introduction of LCD screens, whereas this one doesn't have an LCD, has no kind of screen. 
Um, these valves here, thermionic valves, uh, were very big, hence why these products were very big and heavy and also produce quite a lot of excess heat and all that sort of stuff. So this is the kind of question that could come up. Um, this next question is a bit of a dream question, really. It's talking about sort of environmental impact of uh, the raw material sourcing, the manufacture and the disposal. So that's a relatively uh, straightforward question. But again, a big beefy 12 marker. And then you might come across questions a little bit like this, where it shows you two products. Um, again, this one is giving you materials, the way it functions and some other features. And this one is saying compare the suitability of this mobility aid for use around the home and garden. So it's given you two different areas. So, you know, you've got one indoor and one outdoor and how those might affect the use of the of the product. And this last one is again showing you a product and it gives you a loads of different things here. It's saying analyze and evaluate the suitability of the water pump uh, for this isolated village. That's important, isn't it? Isolated. So things like galvanizing, galvanizing use to ensure that the uh, steel sections um, last a long time, don't need too much maintenance. It's open sourced, so it's not protected by uh, property rights. So the design can be easily modified to suit the location. The use of low carbon steel, it's uh, easy to form, readily available, easily replaced. Standardized nuts and bolts can be easily replaced and hand operated because you may not have access to things like mechanical devices or motors or, or electronic devices. OK, so that's the, those are the kind of questions that you might see come up. And those are all past paper questions. Right. So what we're going to do now is we are going to go through all of the questions that I've put together and bearing in mind that I've looked back through the entire specification for paper two and tried to pick out things that have never been asked about. This question, however, is a comparison question. And this one is between two vacuums. It's asking you to compare um, the ergonomic factors, the suitability of the materials and the manufacturing processes. So we're going to go through ergonomic factors uh, first. So the first thing that you might want to uh, kind of pick out is that the die cast vacuum would be heavier. Um, which would make it maybe more difficult for the user to move and transport the actual product. See here how I've linked it to the actual um, impact that that could have. So it could cause discomfort and potential injury if dropped. So the ABS vacuum is going to be much lighter, easier to manoeuvre and would put less, less strain on the user's body. Ergonomics also is about how colours have been used. So you can see on this product that colour has been used in a very specific way to highlight certain parts. And Dyson are very good at this as well as using bright colours on, on things like the switches, the buttons, the bits that you have to move to open, um, you know, to empty it and all that sort of stuff. So the bright colours um, have been used on figure two to highlight parts that the user needs to interact with. This makes it more intuitive. Uh, and easier to use. In contrast to that, uh, this one is quite plain and simple, and it's not immediately obvious how the product functions. Okay, not as obvious as um, the the newer, more modern uh, vacuum. The next thing that I've picked up for ergonomics is that it is cordless, um, so the the user will not need to consider a cord when using the product. Gives more freedom of movement. Uh, in contrast to figure one, where you've got the cord, which is maybe a bit restrictive. The handle design on figure two is much more ergonomic. It kind of like wraps around the user's hand. And you might want to talk about how maybe anthropometric data has been taken into account to ensure that it fits the, the fifth to the 95th percentile of users. So a large amount of users. Uh, in contrast to the uh, handle on this one, which is at quite an awkward angle and it could cause discomfort, especially considering the weight of the product. Um, one final thing that you could talk about is that the angle of this product can be more easily adjusted because the head pivots when actually um, that is good for sort of taller or shorter users. So those are all some ergonomic factors that you could pick up marks uh, from.
Right, the next thing we're going to talk through is the suitability of the material. So aluminium has been used on this older vacuum, figure one. Um, aluminium, as we know, is quite malleable. So potentially it's, it's not very hard. It could pick up dents and scratches relatively easily. In contrast to that, ABS is actually a scratch resistant thermoplastic. So it's used for things like, uh, you know, like laptop cases. It's used for Lego. It's used for good quality children's toys, for computer mice, um, telephone casings, all that sort of stuff, because it's um, a more expensive, high quality scratch resistant thermoplastic. So it's going to be more resistant to wear and tear from prolonged use. The use of ABS in figure two allows pigments, always talk about pigments, um, because they, uh, due to the use of ABS, it means they can be easily added to enhance the aesthetics of the product. Um, and those can be easily achieved through injection molding. Uh, in contrast to that, the aluminium in figure one would need to be anodized to achieve a similar finish. And that would add another manufacturing step which would obviously increase the cost of the vacuum. Then I've gone for sustainability stuff here. So aluminium is actually, so the one in this one is actually widely recycled. So it could actually be quite easily recovered from the corded vacuum. And that makes that product relatively sustainable. Uh, in contrast to that, so this is maybe one of the only points that I'm focusing on um, the newer vacuum being maybe more of a problem is that ABS and polycarbonate are both thermoplastics and therefore they come from uh, crude oil, which is a finite source. Um, these plastics are not commonly recycled. They could end up in landfill, especially if they are difficult to disassemble. OK, that can cause an issue during um, disposal because more often than not, they are just chucked into uh, one large sort of uh, bin rather than being split up. Now there is specialist recycling areas that are designed to break down products like this, but it might be more difficult potentially than the aluminium vacuum. Right, the last thing I'm going to talk about are the manufacturing processes. So this should be relatively easy to talk through. Figure two is injection molded, which is suitable due to the ability to produce identical complex parts very quickly because this vacuum has got multiple complex parts. Uh, injection, injection molding is therefore very suitable because it also means it can be mass produced. It's a very, very quick process done on a large scale um, that suits the scale of manufacture of the product. And also injection molding would he help to keep the cost, the unit cost, the cost of each product low. In contrast to that, uh, we know that this is a die cast product that's a slower manufacturing process. Um, the casting process is uh, cannot be quite so heavily automated. And also there will be a need to remove any excess um, aluminium and the surface of the aluminium would need to be further finished, which is going to make the cost of the product higher. Um, next point that I've spoken about here is that depending on the quality of the mold used in injection molding, um, the parts come out pretty much ready to go. They're self finishing, which kind of links a little bit more to the material potentially, but you would still get marks for that. So a really high gloss finish can be achieved with no further finishing required, speeds up production, um, lowering costs. Last point that I've picked out is that they are both fabricated, but fabrication means to assemble something. Um, but something that's been made from aluminium may need a more complex joining method, potentially such as a TIG welding or rivets, and that can take a lot more time and more skill. Whereas the injection molded vacuum may have sort of internal clips, plastic clips that are already part of the injection molded components, and they may just sort of snap and clip together. So that would make the product a lot easier to assemble. Right, plenty of marks there to get you the 12. Notice how I went through a variety of different things, linked it back to the uh, product, linked it to things like the scale of manufacture and also a bit of sustainability stuff in there as well. Right, the next question we are going to talk through is this one, explain how UCD, so if you saw that in the exam, would you know what that means? 
is used in the development of products. So UCD is user centered design. I've been particularly mean here. I don't believe the exam uh, AQA would do it like this, but it's just to get you thinking. So user centered design, this is the um, answer I came up with. So user centered design is used to improve the uh, user's experience of products. So to improve the user's experience of products. It means that products are developed with the help of user-centered feedback. Also, things like anthropometrics would be key and also um, carrying out an iterative design process. And what that means is that you may um, come up with a design, you may prototype that, you could get feedback and then you would go back to design again. So you're kind of going round in a circle with lots of client feedback until you get a really refined, well-produced product that's going to meet all the needs of the client okay, or the customer. So um, next bit that I've spoken about here. Focus, this is quite a good one to talk about. Focus groups can be used to observe users interacting with products. And that can help to identify problems with existing products that can then be corrected in the designer's work. <clears throat> so it's basically talking all the time about getting lots of feedback from customers, getting them to interact with the product, using an iterative design process, bringing in things like anthropometrics. So at all times you are considering the user. Right, question three then. User sent, uh, sorry, name the, I'm talking rubbish, name the following symbols. So these ones here, these can be mistaken for the Mobius loop, okay? Um, but actually they are uh, called polymer codes. And you will see them usually on the bottom of any plastic molded product. And it might have a number. So number one actually stands for PET, which is polyester. Um, number five stands for polypropylene. I think number six is polystyrene. And the higher the number, the more difficult they are to recycle in terms of how widely recycled they are. So your local area may not have um, the facilities to recycle those polymers. They may need to be recycled somewhere else. OK, so that's what polymer codes are. FSC is the forest uh, or yeah, forest stewardship uh, council uh, if you see that on any type of paper or card it means that the material has come from a sustainably managed forest meaning that the amount of um, trees cut down is carefully controlled they're replanted habitats are looked after <coughs> all that sort of stuff and the last one is uh, it's got a funny french name but it's to do with European conformity. That's what that means. So it means that it conforms to all the safety um, kind of standards and things that are necessary to sell products uh, in Europe. So there we go. Polymer codes, Forest Stewardship Council and European conformity. Be careful because you could get shown different codes. There's one that looks like a which one is it? it's like the kite mark and it has like BSI. So that's the, the kite mark. It's not a heart. It's something like that. Though. I've forgotten. There are a few symbols that you need to make sure that you know. There's another one with like a uh, a lion. Yes, that's a lion before you ask. And that one is to do with toys. Um, I think it's called it's called the lion mark, bizarrely. So just make sure you have a look at some of those symbols because they could catch you out if you're not careful. Right. This one could be very, very tricky. So question four, explain the purpose of critical path analysis. Now, this is a six marker, which is quite a lot of marks for something like this, because there's only so much you can say about it. Um, this is a type of project management. Um, it's, yeah, it's a type of project management to kind of make things more efficient. So this is the answer that I wrote. Um, critical path analysis is used to schedule efficient completion of process stages. So the main thing I can relate this to is in your NEA, I asked you to write down construction stages. And that's almost like you doing a critical path analysis. You're working out what needs to be made. But then 
in manufacturing, that would be taken one step further to work out <coughs> how that manufacturing process can be made as lean, so as quick and um, without any sort of waste, to make cycle times shorter and costs lower. OK, so a sequence of tasks is then established um, and then any like unnecessary waiting times. So if there is a big wait between you carrying out two uh, stages, it's like identifying them and working up, working out how you can speed up, speed up that process and things that can run in parallel. So, for example, say you were um, you were carrying out a process here. And it was something like, you know, 3D print something. And maybe during that time, you could be doing another task, like marking something out. Um, almost like a Gantt chart when I made you made you do those awful Gantt charts for your NEA. It's working out if tasks can run in parallel, which would then help to make the process even more efficient. OK, so can tasks run in parallel? Um, and that's all to do with critical path analysis. It's basically improving the efficiency of manufacturing the product through sequencing of the manufacturing stages. OK, so that was a six marker. This one, um, Marianne Brandt is one of the only designers who's never had a question asked about them in the exam. Um, this one is explain how the work of Marianne Brandt reflects the Bauhaus design movement. This is only a three marker. This is the question, the um, answer that I put together. So Marianne Brandt is a former student of the Bauhaus and used simple forms in her design work. So straight away that would get you a mark because that reflects the Bauhaus style. Her kitchenware was geometrically pure. Excellent little quote there for anything to do with Bauhaus. Um, and it had no excessive decoration or ornamentation. So that would definitely probably get you a couple of marks there, already probably picking up three marks for this question. The function was prioritised. So there is an example of like a teapot that she designed and it's something, something like this. It has like a little handle sticking out the side and a little lid on the top, all that sort of thing. And for example, the design is quite stylish looking, but the handle has been made from a material that's not going to conduct heat. The uh, lid makes sure that it doesn't drip when it's being used. So the function of the product is prior prioritised and that therefore meant that the products were commercially successful because Bauhaus was all about good design available to the masses um, and needed to be commercial, needed to be functional. OK, so other designers that have not been mentioned uh, Mark Newson has never come up. Um, Dyson has never come up. Margaret Calvert, who designs the like men at work uh, sign, which looks like they've got like an umbrella kind of thing like this. The only time that's come up is in a maths question. So just uh, look through and make sure that you are happy with all the designers. Right. This one here. Name two types of project management systems. So there are four different ones in the book. We've already mentioned one, which is critical path analysis. Um, the other ones that you need to know about are these ones. So this one is critical path analysis that we've just spoken about. Um, sequ sequ sequencing of tasks. Going mad there. The other ones, uh, TQM is total quality uh, management. And that is uh, all about thinking about how to make things lean, uh, continuous improvement. We'll go through this in a second. Uh, I spilled that one, but never mind. These two are really weird that Scrum's relatively easy to remember because it's all to do with working in a team to achieve kind of like um, goals right quite quickly. Um, Six Sigma is probably the weirdest one. So we're going to go through that one in a little bit more detail. So very, very quickly, uh, Scrum, which is a project management uh, technique. I'm just going to get through this, get rid of this for a second. And basically what it's all about is working in a team to meet goals in short time scale sprints. OK, hence the sort of sporty uh, acronym. It's um, making sure that you can be quite agile and make changes quite quickly. 
So goals are sort of specified and the feedback is daily, which is quite important because then that allows you to have quite a quick response to any issues that may arise. So that's what Scrum is. It's all about working in a team, um, kind of getting together and thinking quickly, achieving goals in sort of sprints, doing that quite quickly and then feeding back and responding, being quite agile to um, modifying your manufacturing process. The critical path analysis we've already spoken about on the previous question, so we won't talk about that again. This one, uh, total quality management, this aims to remove waste and make products right first time. Fantastic quote. That is an excellent quote for anything to do with quality assurance, because by implementing quality assurance procedures, like checking machinery, making sure your staff are trained properly, that ensures uh, that products are made right first time. And that's kind of a little bit about what this process is used. And it's all about continuous improvement of the manufacturing process. Even just skimming off a few seconds here and there to improve will have a massive impact um, over the, the sort of timescales that you're working with. And the workforce is really heavily involved. So people on assembly lines, production lines, their views, their feedback is taken on board and their, their suggestions for improvements are taken forward. They are actually implemented. So that can be quite motivating um, for people that work in the business in contrast to some assembly lines where they are just sort of treated as mindless robots, not really doing anything. No, and that can be quite you know, miserable and, and make the working environment quite depressing. Whereas this, um, people are kind of rewarded for coming up with new ways of uh, improving the manufacturing systems. So that's TQM, Total Quality Management. Right, this one's really weird. This is called Six Sigma. Um, and it's all about reducing mistakes to only 3.4 in a million. Don't ask me why it's 3.4. Uh, that clearly needs a little bit more research. But they are, it's like a, a list of five steps and it's D-M-A-I-C is the acronym that you need to try and remember. And it's a procedure that monitors, assesses and improves each stage of design and manufacture. So I've come up with quite a scary looking image to hopefully help you remember this. So here's the D. The first thing that you need to do is say there is a problem, a problem in your manufacturing um, system and you need to, to define the issue requiring improvement. So you need to work out actually what it is. Um, so you need to define it. The next thing is that you need to do, and I find that guy incredibly, incredibly uh, creepy, is measure the extent of the issue. So measure how much this is affecting your manufacturing process. Then what you need to do is, yes, I know that's a little bit inappropriate, but never mind. Uh, you need to analyze where the issue uh, occurs. So you need to work out where it's happening in your manufacturing system. I couldn't find an I, so there you go. You need to improve by introducing some procedures to fix the problem. And then you need to make sure that you control that, you monitor it basically. Um, and make sure that you control the new procedures through effective quality assurance. So D-M-A-I-C, that's how you need to try and remember it. OK, define, measure, analyze, improve, control. And that's all to do with Six Sigma. So obviously this question only asks you to name the different project management systems. But imagine if a, a question came up asking you to name uh, three steps in Six Sigma. Um, so you could talk about define, measure, analyze, or one of those ones. So D-M-A-I-C. I don't know if you'll be able to forget that uh, quite scary image there. Right. This is now the second part of the um, exam, commercial manufacture. This is 50 marks in this section. And the first question is um, about different directives. So these are basically like laws. Um, rules that manufacturers have to follow and they are usually to protect the environment or protect human health or um, to kind of uh, improve sustainability of things. So here are three. 
that could come up potentially. The battery directive, um, ROHS and end of life vehicles. So the battery directive, this is all about um, limiting the use of mercury and cadmium, which are both very uh, toxic materials, especially if they are hand handled by people or they leaked potentially into uh, the ground and went into groundwater. They are common chemicals used in batteries. Um, chemicals, elements, I'm not sure. Um, and basically this directive aims to limit their use. So there is a little symbol for this directive and you may have seen it before. It's like a little um, sort of wheelie bin thing. That's a terrible picture of a wheelie bin. And it's got like a cross through it. <clears throat> so what that means is uh, the symbol indicates that batteries must be disposed of in a specific location and cannot go into general waste. So you will see in places like the supermarkets, there are specific little areas that you can dispose of batteries and also things like printer cartridges and stuff like that, because the chemicals, if they leak out, can be very uh, dangerous. So the battery directive directive is to protect from limit the use of those mercury and cadmium and also to ensure batteries don't go into general waste. Right. R.O.H.S. is the restriction of hazardous substances. So this restrict restricts the use of hazardous chemicals. So we've got mercury and cadmium again and added to this, we've got lead and chromium in electrical products. So these um, these substances, if um, kind of handled or like again, like the battery one, if they leak into the environment, they can really be quite damaging. So ROHS is the restriction of hazardous substances and it makes sure that um, products don't use a lot of these substances um, to protect the environment and protect people. So make sure you know that restriction of hazardous substances. Right. The end of life vehicles. No, this doesn't mean a hearse, which was one of the funniest answers I had in the revision session today. This means that when cars um, end up, you know, once their end of life has happened, they're at the end of their life cycle. It's basically a European directive and it's aimed at making the dismantling and recycling of old cars more envir environmentally friendly. So it's doing things like recovering more finite materials like low carbon steel, um, different polymers, maybe, and um, reducing, therefore, the number of raw materials that would need to be uh, made again. So recycling them, basically, and making it the dismantling of the product easier. Uh, so sometimes products can be made um, so that they are very, very difficult to take apart with the use of glues and things like that. Um, and laminates, but this directive is certain rules that need to be in place to make sure that um, a car can be easily taken apart. So that's end of life uh, vehicles. Really, really, I would look carefully. It's like the last chapter of the book, um, right at the back, and it's like a table, and it has loads of these different directives. One of them also is, I think it's called, we the waste electrical Oh, something or other, but it's basically like making sure that electrical products are recycled, the uh, precious metals and things in them can be recovered, all of that sort of stuff. OK, so my biggest advice is to make sure that you are happy with all of those. Right. The next question is all about the Industrial Revolution and explaining how it affected the work of arts and crafts designers. So arts and crafts is one of the only design movements that hasn't come up in a past paper. My answer to this question is as follows. The arts and crafts movement was a rebellion against machinery made products. So during the Industrial Revolution, um, products were being made more by machinery than being made traditionally. And lots of designers uh, didn't like that and they wanted to be using those traditional skill, skills again. So during the Industrial Revolution, many designers reacted to the loss of traditional skills in such fields as things like carpentry and ceramics. So in ceramics, pots would be more traditionally thrown on a potter's wheel, whereas in the Industrial Revolution, they started to be cast 
um, which was a lot quicker, more of mass production, but you lose that handmade um, sort of feel to the product. So arts and crafts promoted on honest handmade products with traditional methods, such as mortise and tenon joints, dovetail joints. The natural beauty of the materials were uh, highlighted and celebrated and kept relatively simple to kind of highlight them rather than the like overly fake decorated pieces that were coming out during the Industrial Revolution. So if you're asked to give an example of a arts and crafts designer, um, a really good one was William Morris. Um, and yes, like I said, linking that with uh, the Industrial Revolution and how products were being made by machines is the key thing for that question. Right, hefty question here. So this is a nine marker. This is about the development of microelectrics and manufacturing methods and how that has led to many improvements in product design or products. Explain how these developments have had an impact and give examples in your answer. Now, this could be really hard. I've had it before when I've been sat in an exam. It's asked you to give an example and you can't think of anything. And you start chatting a load of rubbish about the pen that you've got in your hand and the chair you're sat on and all sorts of crap. So making sure that you've got some examples that you can talk about is crucial for questions like this. So I'm going to go through the couple that I would uh, mention, especially with anything to do with the development of microelectrics um, or electronics. So if we look at this first paragraph here, um, and I've spoken about the development of integrated circuits. So what that means is those, those circuits have got loads and loads and loads and loads of little transistors and components all soldered onto basically like a little chip, like a microcontroller. So in the 1960s, these first started to be developed and the amount that these have um, developed, the, the, the power of them that has increased is insane. And this allowed consumer products such as gaming devices, mobile phones to, come, to become much more powerful, meaning that portable devices can do things like connect to the internet, they can play games, they can stream movies, they can take high quality photographs. All of that has been made possible by the development of integrated uh, circuits, becoming much, 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 much smaller, lighter, more efficient, more powerful. The second key thing that I would talk about is the development of the transistor. This happened in the 1940s and earlier in the video I showed you a radio that was a real big chunk of a product. And the reason that it was so big is because these valves um, were basically massive. And they did the same job as a transistor. Uh, they helped to amplify, um, but they were very large. So before, before transistors were um, kind of created, so for example, to give you an idea of the size, imagine that's a thermionic valve and a transistor is like that big, absolutely minuscule. But before, those new components, um, the valves and things were large, they were heavy and they generated a lot of heat. There was a lot of wasted energy. So the introduction of the transistor, it reduced the size of components dramatically, allowing products to be portable and also giving designers more freedom with how they actually uh, design electrical products such as radios and TVs. So there's plenty in there that would get you loads of marks for this um, section. Other things that you could potentially talk about are things like the development of the LED. Um, you could talk about um, the battery sort of um, technology, but mostly for microelectrics, I would go with integrated circuits and transistors as the two main that you can talk relatively uh, in detail about. OK, right. The next one I'm going to talk about is, or the next bit I'm going to talk about is manufacturing methods, how those have improved. So in this first paragraph here, I mean, the introduction of polymer manufacture um, in like the 1950s, 1960s, maybe slightly earlier, um, allowed designers to incorporate a much wider range of colours and shapes into their products. So there's a chair made by um 
Vernier Panton that looks a little bit like this. I'm doing a terrible job of drawing it, but this was an injection molded chair. Um, before that, it was actually made through the layup process, which is quite time consuming. But then once injection molding was introduced, it could be mass produced because you can produce high quality complex parts. It's much lower cost. Um, and then it enabled uh, polymer products to be made on a mass scale. So injection molding, blow molding, extrusion, rotational molding, all of those manufacturing methods had a massive impact on products. More lightweight, they could be made hollow, um, they could be made in one piece rather than having like the sides of a radio that needed to be fabricated and connected together. You could have almost like a one piece product. So that had a massive impact. I reckon you could jabber on about that and get four or five marks just from that. The other one that I've picked out is the development of rapid prototyping. And I have focused in not just on FDM, which is the type of 3D printing that we use, which is fused deposition modeling, which basically means just layer by layer, the layers are fused, melted together. I focused on metal 3D printing because that is actually having a massive impact because metal parts are now able to, uh, metal 3D parts, are 3D printed parts are able to take the place of more traditionally manufactured components. So a component that would usually maybe be turned or uh, milled, those products can now actually start to be replaced with um, 3D printed metal parts, especially in things like aircraft and medical implants and, uh, you know, like aerospace applications. So what have I actually put? I've put metal parts can now be made using 3D printing. 3D printing of metal is different. It's called direct metal laser sintering. Sintering just means like the, me the melting of um, a material so it like joins together, it fuses together. And if you haven't watched my video on rapid prototyping, that might be a good one to have a look through because this is a little bit different. You, it's not like the metal is heated and deposited like a traditional 3D printer. Imagine the temperatures that would need to be produced. It would be mad. So what happens is you have a bed of uh, metal powder, it could be aluminium, titanium, whatever. And basically what happens is a laser uh, sinters or melts together in certain places each layer. And each time it's melted, a new layer of dust is put on top and the next layer is melted and it builds the part like that. OK, so this the, the really good thing is that it results in uh, a lot less material wastage and it means that you can start to make much more complex uh, parts that would be very difficult to manufacture in traditional ways like casting and things like that. And these have started, like I said, to be used in real world products. So plenty there to get you those marks. But like I said, if you haven't watched my developments in microelectronics, developments in CAD CAM, uh, new materials, new manufacturing processes, have a look at those. Because even if you just remember one from each, that might give you something you can talk about in a question like this. Right. Slightly shorter uh, question here. Um, question 10. Explain how a designer would use each of the following types of prototype. Now, this is hard because you might think you might be thinking what? There's only one type of prototype, a prototype's prototype. But in the specification, there are three different types of prototype. And it's quite obvious once I go through it, but could catch you out if you've not heard of this before. So there is a visual prototype that basically means a prototype that is used just to show the kind of overall shape and aesthetic of uh, the product. So say, for example, you were making a vacuum, like a handheld vacuum cleaner. It wouldn't actually include any of the internal mechanisms or any electronics. It would just show the shape and the aesthetics. So the benefit of that is you may show it to your clients um, or customers really early on in the design process to see what the visual impact of the design is. Do they actually like the look of it before you start to develop how the product actually functions? So a visual prototype is just for you to look at, to get an idea of the aesthetics, no moving parts, no mechanisms. In contrast to that, a proof of concept prototype 
this might look like a real hodgepodge of components all sort of jumbled together because the idea is it just shows the technical aspects of a design. It might just show that a certain mechanism can work as intended. So it will not look like the final product. Um, it may use sort of like off the shelf components like um, in the final product, you may use a particular uh, spring, for example, that will be made just for that product. But you may use something that you've just bought, like a stock form. Um, and it allows the design team to see if the idea actually can work. So it might be better for products that are more um, innovative. They may have a unique way of working. Um, but it's a proof of concept. So some of the products that were made this year that were very complex, um, they may not look exactly how the product would if it was mass produced, but it shows it proves that the concept works. The final prototype is basically like a real representation of how the final mass produced product would actually look and function. So the materials used in it would be real production materials. So if it's going to be injection molded, they may uh, injection mold it. They may 3D print it out of the same sort of materials. Um, and say a batch of these prototypes would actually be shared with a focus group to actually gather feedback before the company commits to actually mass producing the product. So a little batch of these production prototypes may be given to certain uh, demographic groups to gather feedback um, and it represents basically how the final mass produced product would look and also function. So it's kind of a combination of the last two. Um, so, yeah, those are the three different types. Don't let that catch you out because it's relatively simple once you think about it. But those are the three that are listed in the specification. Right. The next question. Explain the benefits of a circular economy. So a circular economy, if this comes up in the exam, um, this can be uh, relatively simple to talk about, or if they ask you to talk about biological nutrients and technical nutrients, that could catch you out. So basically a circular economy helps to preserve finite resources by basically recovering and, and recycling them. So the idea being that um, rather than a cradle uh, to grave, approach where you buy the product, you use it, and then you throw it away and it ends up in like a landfill or whatever. This idea is that it goes cradle uh, to cradle. So you buy the product, you use it. All of the materials that can be recovered are the rest might biodegrade, whatever. And those materials can be used to make the next product. So it's kind of almost like how nature works that um, you know animals that die you know circle of life and all that bit of lion king actually go to help um the next sort of generation grow okay a bit cheesy but you know you know what i mean so a circular economy does its best to um work against the unsustainable culture that we kind of have which is buying using and throwing out throwing away products it ensures more of a cradle to cradle approach, which is to try and reduce pollution and the impact of product manufacturer on the environment. So circular economy, all about recovering any materials that you can. Make sure that you have a quick look at what a biological nutrient means. Basically means anything that can be like biodegrade or can com can be basically compostable like paper and potato pack and food and stuff like that. And a technical nutrient would be something that um, needs to be recovered because it might be a finite resource like a precious metal or maybe a type of polymer that can be recycled. So they are like more like man made materials uh, or process materials that would need to go back into the manufacture of the new product. So circular economy. Um, hasn't come up much in the past, so worth a look in your revision this week. Right, next one, question six. Describe how designers can respond to world events such as migration and poverty. Give examples in your answer. So this could be quite tricky. There is a whole section in the book that talks about 
like social impact of design. And this one is talking about things like um, how design can help with migration. So migration may be, may be uh, caused by things like conflict. So if we think about Ukraine, if we think about Syria, if we think about those types of areas where people are having to leave, they could have issues um, accessing clean water, having shelter, medical issues, all that sort of stuff. And um, basically, design, how can design help and give some examples of how it has helped? So this is the answer I wrote. So design can be used to aid those during times of hardship. Uh, conflict across the world can cause many people to migrate, resulting in problems such as access to clean water, shelter and clothing. Now, here's my first example. It's a really nice example, actually. It's in the book. And IKEA actually have they produced a flat pack uh, shelter called the Better Shelter, which I really, really like. And it basically means it can be easily delivered because it's flat pack. It can be assembled without tools because obviously during a bit of an emergency situation, you are not going to have a Phillips screwdriver handy. Um, and also the shelter includes things like solar power and it's really well insulated to protect from the cold. So that's a good example. There are other examples in the book. I would encourage you to have a look, but that's a really good example of a big company that has used design to um, uh, respond to a world event. OK, the next paragraph is a little bit about poverty. <clears throat> so poverty in developing countries has been tackled by many designers. One of the most famous actually was Trevor Bayliss, and he designed the wind up radio that required no batteries. You might be thinking, actually, well, why does it really matter that people in uh, poverty, say, for example, in developing countries wouldn't have access to a radio? Well, actually, um, during sort of like the 1980s, during the AIDS crisis, a lot of educational messages were um, given uh, over the news and on radio. So making sure that people in remote areas had access to important messages and education was a really massive um, thing to help with certain um, conditions that they might find themselves in. Also, I've spoken about this charity before, it's called Practical Action, and they use open design a lot, for example, in their design of things like water filtration units, water pumps, and transportation um, devices as well. So this was a six marker, plenty in there to get you the six marks. But can you see that I've referenced uh, a couple of examples and um, having those examples is essential because it gives you more to talk about um, and also shows the examiner that you've got a good awareness um, outside of just, uh, you know, learning what certain terms mean. It kind of shows your understanding a bit better. Right. Number 13, uh, use an example. Uh, we'll see, use an example to explain how demand pull can affect the design of products. This is an interesting one because in the GCSE specification, the uh, demand pull is called something else. It is called market pull, which is really weird because it's the same exam board. So market pull and technology uh, push. That's what it's called at GCSE. But in A level, it's called demand pull. Don't ask me why, but it basically means the same thing. And what it means is, um, is when designers respond to the wants of customers. So in contrast to technology push, which would be um, new products, manufacturing methods discovered because of new technology. So, for example, the Kindle was um, produced due to a development in the, the kind of like uh, the, the quite innovative screen that it uses. Um, the cyclone technology on the Dyson uh, vacuum, you could argue it's a bit of demand pull and a bit of te technology push. Um, but there are certain products that use technology push a lot more. The iPad, I'd say, would have been a technology push product because at the time, not many people were like, oh, I really need an oversized phone to watch the Internet on. It was a bit weird when it first came out. We didn't really know what to do with it. Um, we had one, a first generation one, and we literally were like, uh, well, we've got a laptop and we've got a phone. What do we do with this thing? So that was more of a technology push. 
But demand pull is, like I said, when they respond to the wants of consumers. So consumers may want a range of desirable features to be added to products. And I've used the example of mobile phones and cars. And I've given the, the classic example of the addition of a front facing camera on mobile phones because people wanted to take selfies for sort of social media and all that sort of stuff. Um, some other examples that you could talk about larger memory on smartphones because people wanted to be able to take more photographs, store more documents on there, having a longer battery life. You could say that's a bit, you could argue both for, uh, for, for each sort of thing really, but a longer battery life, um, consumers wanted that from their portable products. And bags for life, people uh, wanted to not be using single use plastics anymore. And they wanted a product that, um, you know, helped them to be more sustainable. And uh, Bag for Life was a really good reaction to that. Same as things like um, energy efficient light bulbs. OK, so those are some good examples of products that have been made through demand pull. Right. Define the term tolerance. So tolerance, you uh, might reference it when talking about things like quality control, quality assurance. So tolerance is an acceptable level of accuracy. It's usually written as a plus or minus, and it might give you a measurement after that. It means that, for example, something could be 0.1 millimeters bigger or 0.1 millimeters smaller and still be within tolerance. If it was outside of those measurements, so say it was a millimeter too big, then it would be outside of tolerance. OK, so fine tolerances are needed when parts need to fit together. Um, so, for example, a lid on a fizzy drink bottle would have quite a small tolerance because otherwise it wouldn't actually function. It wouldn't screw on uh, tight enough to function properly to hold the drink inside. So during quality control checks, uh, components that are not within tolerance are rejected. And that can happen during quality assurance because you may um, reject materials before you actually make a product so that they're not within tolerance. So, for example, if you were uh, ordered a piece of um, acrylic and it was supposed to be three millimeter sheet and it was much bigger in certain sections, <clears throat> that might not come within your tolerance. And on an actual product, you may check um, a dimension of a certain part. OK, so that's what tolerance is. Name two benefits of using a go no go gauge. This could really catch you out, especially if you don't know what one of these is. Here is an example. It's a really simple little device and you can see that the color is being color coded to make it almost like idiot proof in a way that basically if you were checking, say, for example, a hole on a component. So say I had a product like this and it had a hole through it like this. For this hole to be within tolerance, this end would need to go. It would need to fit inside, but this end would need to not fit. So it would be a go and a no go. OK, so if that end there, if that fitted in, the product would be out of tolerance. OK, so by using a go no go gauge, it basically means that you can test very quickly as you don't have to whip out your measuring tape or your vernier calipers or whatever for each one you can just really really quickly carry out that operation and it also remo removes the sort of human error from the quality control process because you'd have to be i don't understand how you could mess that up unless you mixed up the ends i guess but yeah it makes it a lot easier quicker and removes the human error from quality control checking Right, question 16. What was the purpose of the Council of Industrial Design? Not a nice question. OK, so this one um, is all about a specific thing that was created to try and make Britain more competitive after um, the World Wars. So it was during um, sort of the Second World War when utility products were widely used. Um, and people were growing really tired of the sort of drab, boring design. So the purpose of the Council of Industrial Design, COID, was to improve the standards of design through training and assessment. So basically, um, they, they created the Royal, um, 
the like the university is called the Royal something of arts, Royal College of Arts in London. And it's like teaching people how to design properly. So there was a big focus on design education because during this time, utility products were literally like, oh, you need a chair. Well, here's a chair. And it was really dull, functional. Wow. How exciting sort of thing. Whereas um, people wanted things to be a little bit more exciting and decorative. So the Council of Industrial De Design aimed to make Britain more competitive after the Second World War. We wanted to be seen as leaders in design once again. So what they did was they held two really big exhibitions to promote British design. Um, one of the ones I reckon you, you could do with remembering is the Festival of Britain. Um, there was also one called Britain Can Make It, which sounds like something off Blue Peter, if you know what Blue Peter was. Um, but these happened sort of like a few years after the war ended. And these events drew people from all over the world to promote uh, Britain as a design leader again. And they included everything, homeware, car design, all sorts of different things um, to try and show that we are more interesting and can compete on a worldwide uh, level with other countries in design. So the Council of Industrial Design, make sure you're happy with that. Right, last few questions now. So number 17, explain how digital measuring devices can be used to monitor quality control. So there's a few that you could talk about here. You could talk about things like uh, laser scanning and the use of things like probes. The one that I focused on is the use of this thing, the vernier caliper. If you don't know what this looks like, it basically looks like this kind of thing. Uh, you may have used it in your uh, in your NEA. It has like a digital readout here. And basically this comes uh, together like that and it gives you a very, very accurate reading. So a vernier caliper can be used to measure dimensions in a range of situations. So basically here, the benefit of, of a, a vernier caliper over other things, especially like a go no go gauge, which is designed purely for one measurement. This can be used in a range of different situations to measure lots of different um, areas of a product. So it's not limited uh, to one operation and can be used on uh, various components. It makes the device quite flexible. So just like a manufacturing process can be flexible because you can change it quite easily. So is uh, this type of quality uh, control check. And how would you do it? Well, you would take a product off the production line and you would measure it using the caliper. So you might you, you might measure things like internal and external dimensions, as well as depth measurements to check things like tolerances. OK, so. Making sure that you understand how uh, digital measuring devices can be used, um, that could potentially be something that comes up, or it could be something that you put into another question about quality control and quality assurance. Right, question 18, define the term, the internet of things, use examples in your answer. So the internet of things is all about loads of different types of products being connected over things like over like a network. So the Internet of Things is a term used to describe when multiple products are connected on a network, like I just said. This can be used in manufacturing. So I've I've spoken about how it can be used in manufacturing as well as in consumer products. So in manufacturing, it can be used to streamline the ordering of, material, of materials and servicing of machinery. So for example, imagine you had a certain piece of machinery on the production line, say it was a die cutter. So this is the die cutter, there's the die and it's cutting its thing and it's going up and down all the time. Basically, this will be connected to a network. So it will have, what's the Wi-Fi signal uh, thing? What is it like that or something? It'll be connected. And after so many operations, it may automatically trigger uh, like maintenance. So it will basically help to stop um, the problem of this machine just breaking and then having to wait for someone to be able to come and fix it, which could slow down the manufacturing process. But because this is actually um, <coughs> connected to a network, it can do that automatically. So that's the Internet of Things, connecting 
uh, machinery, but also in a manufacturing situation, if you have a pot that's full of products or components, once they are all removed, um, a barcode could be scanned, for example, automatically, potentially, and that could then trigger more ordering of those materials. Um, so that can really help to streamline uh, manufacturing processes and keep everyone informed of what's going on as well. Uh, the Internet of Things can also be seen in consumer products, such as we've actually got it, and I bet you guys have as well, that your central heating, um, your parents might have like an app on their phone. That's your central heating system basically connected to your Wi-Fi um, so that you can control it from you can control it from anywhere, which is, um, you know, helping to improve the use of that particular product. So if it gets particularly cold, you can turn it on before you come home. I've seen the Internet of Things used in fridges when um, uh, things like when products are removed, it might automatically put it on your shopping list or things like that. Put it in the shopping list for Tesco's or whatever. So the Internet of Things is basically everything being connected on a network, talking together, communicating to help streamline uh, lots of different operations. Right. The final question I'm going to go through is question 19. It's um, ways of generating ideas. So uh, in your NEA, think back to when you were first coming up with your design ideas. There are some specific ways that you can generate ideas or, or discuss ideas. And these are in the specification. Um, they're a bit odd, but actually, bizarrely, Scamper um, was one that came up in my degree. And I'm thinking hats is a really weird one, but I bet some of you might recognise this potentially from things like psychology, where you might have to have different viewpoints and argue and sort of play devil's advocate, which is like arguing a point that maybe wouldn't usually be your point. OK, so Scamper basically stands for these things. So Scamper is an acronym and it means to rethink existing designs. So say you had the design, and I remember doing this in my degree, you have the design of a vacuum, the button at the top, you've got the, you know, the uh, where the dust goes there, you've got that at the bottom, you've got the cord coming off. Um, basically, it's getting you to think about how things can be changed. So each letter encourages you to change something about the idea. So, for example, um, reversing or uh, reversing something. So maybe having this component on the back. I don't know. Maybe combining different parts together. So can the emptying of the dust container be combined with the button in some way? I don't know. It makes you think about how designs can be changed in lots of different ways. So substituting, changing things for different components or different materials, combining different parts together, adapting different functions, modifying certain parts, putting other things to another use, uh, eliminating some parts like the cord, eliminating the cord um, and even reversing things. So like trying things upside down. I told you it was daft, but this is what this basically means, scamper. So try and remember that because it could come up in the exam it could ask you a question like what uh what processes or methods do designers use to generate ideas and this would be a good one to come up with if you had it okay other things that you could put to that answer though is you could say things like mood boards which is like inspirational materials um you could look at like existing products but these uh here the scamper is like an official one that's in the book. Um, another one that's in the book, which I haven't mentioned here, is something like four by four. And I used to do this all the time in my previous job, um, in my previous school, where you people hate doing it. But you sketch your idea here. Then you pass this paper to the next person who will redraw the design and add something different to it or change something. Then you change. Then you send it to the next person. They change something again and they change something again. So it's almost like a way of getting lots of people to collaborate together and combine ideas together. OK, the second one that I want to talk about is called thinking hats. So thinking hats, uh, you don't actually have to wear a hat. So don't start talking about people putting cowboy hats on and things like that. <clears throat> they are imaginary hats. But basically, this helps to improve creative discussion 
and helps people work collaboratively, so together. So it says six coloured hats are worn, but I mean, they're not really, it's just imaginary. And the idea being that depending on what imaginary hat you have on is what your sort of viewpoint is. So the white hat here is you would be very much thinking about the facts and the figures. So you might give the cost of the product and how much tensile strength a particular material have has. Uh, the red hat wearer might talk about how the product makes someone feel, the aesthetics of it, all that sort of stuff. The black hat might be quite judgmental of the product or quite cautious. The yellow hat might talk about advantages and benefits of certain features. The green hat might explore different ideas in a bit more detail. Um, and the blue hat, thinking about thinking, that just sounds horrible. So they're almost leading the discussion a little bit. So don't get caught out by this. <clears throat> this is another way of coming up with ideas, discussing ideas. Um, just another thing that could potentially come up in the exam that I don't want to uh, catch you out. So I hope that was useful. Have a look at some of the videos that are on um, the VLE task about paper two. Um, there is a specific one on there as well that goes through like, tricky things that might catch you out. So I hope that was useful, like I say, and uh, best of luck on the exam. I won't see you on the next video. This will probably be the last video you see. So best of luck with the exam.